a red light is on and that we, you have an opportunity to be heard. And I would yield at this time to the gentleman from Florida for any opening statement he'd like to make on behalf of the Democrats. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I anxiously look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses, and uh, thank you for calling the hearing. <coughs> and I have nothing further to add at this time. I thank the gentleman very much. Both of you um, come before this committee on a yearly basis. Uh, I remember your testimony well last year when both of you felt very strongly about uh, medical records, things which you had been working on, things which you were going to engage, not just your subcommittee, but really the entire Congress on and the administration. And I'm delighted that both of you are here. Mr. Bishop, as you know, this committee uh, takes to heart and listens to the things which you bring to bear, not only your ideas, uh, but also your leadership on behalf of your party. And you are welcome to be here. I would defer at this time, if I can, to the young man from Texas, the gentleman, Chairman Culverson. Gentleman's right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members. It's a privilege for me to be here with my good friend from Georgia. Uh, Mr. Bishop, is, uh, as a fellow Eagle Scout, I just realized, as you mentioned that, uh, Chairman Sessions, my, uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Bishop and I and our subcommittee have brought this bill to you in a unified uh, way on behalf of the, it really is a humbling experience to serve on this subcommittee and be able to provide peace of mind to our men and women in, in uniform when they are uh, standing on the walls of Rome, standing and watch over this country overseas, and in, uh, when they retire and go into the VA system. It is humbling to meet these young men and women and to have a chance to to help them, and we have in the tight budget circumstances we find ourselves in today fully funded the request of the Veterans Administration, Mr. Chairman, to make uh, certain that our, our uh, veterans, our, as our service members as they retire and become veterans and go into the VA system, have everything that they need for the best medical care this nation can provide to them. And uh, we have at the same time, however, as you said in your opening statement, quite correctly, uh, accepted the administration and the uh, Pentagon's request for military construction at a level that is a, about $1.8 billion less than, than last year because the, the, uh, what we have not, because the, 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 the services decided to take the, uh, the um, reduction in um, maintenance and operations rather than in readiness. They wanted to be sure that our men and women in uniform have everything that they need and uh, so the services came to our subcommittee and asked that we do a little less in, in military construction this year so they could focus on readiness in light of our tight budget circumstances. But our, um, our bill is one that we bring to you in a bipartisan, unified fashion. It, it includes $71.5 billion in discretionary uh, funding, uh, about $398 million less than the, than the budget request, uh, while uh, it, al it also contains... 64.7 billion in discretionary funding for the VA, about 1.5 billion dollars more than last year, Mr. Chairman. And it, this includes 20 million to get at the claims backlog, and about 17 million more than was requested to deal with the electronic uh, health record uh, interoperability problem. But we had in our bill, as you as you quite correctly mentioned last year, we were so upset and concerned with the lack of interoperability and the medical records as you move from the uniform, take off the uniform and go into the VA system, DOD and VA continue to operate two completely different medical record systems, so they, don't, they can't talk to each other. It just makes no sense. It's been, as far as we can tell, the law since about 2008, Sanford, that they have an interoperable medical record, and therefore to ensure that they move as rapidly as humanly possible. Uh, last year, we included identical language compelling them to move forward. They still are fiddling around with it. So this year, we're trying a little different tack. We're included in the bill. We're going to give them 25% of their funding uh, up front, but we we'll hold back the remaining 75% of the money until they come back to Mr. Bishop and I in this Congress and show us that they are moving rapidly towards a completely transparent, interoperable uh, medical record uh, that can be read uh, quickly by the VA and or the DOD. In fact, we've begun the effort to get have a joint hearing to sit down and talk to the Secretary of Defense and, this, and the Secretary of the VA uh, with uh, Chairman Friedlinghuysen's uh, subcommittee in order to drive home how important this is. We just simply can't have young men and women suffering injuries overseas in defense of this nation and uh, moving into the VA system and the VA cannot read the medical records. It's, I've been using Apple Macintosh computers since they first came out in 19, 
85, and if you can run a Windows operating system on an Apple Macintosh computer, surely the VA and DOD can get an interoperable medical record in uh, the 21st century. So we present this bill to you with pride, Mr. Chairman. It, uh, it, it, it uh, does everything that our men and women in uniform have asked us to do, and, uh, and then some. And we're going to make sure that they uh, are taken care of and they've got the peace of mind they deserve from serving this nation. I'd be happy to, to yield this time for any questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and I appreciate your forthright testimony. Uh, and I would now yield to the gentleman uh, from Georgia, Mr. Bishop. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for yielding, and uh, I appreciate very much uh, uh, your uh, very, very uh, uh, supportive comments and uh, those of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the comments from my chairman, uh, Mr. Carberson. Uh, I'm glad to be here today going through the regular process, uh, which you can do when both sides cooperate. Uh, as you all know, the bill has a strong reputation for common ground and bipartisanship as members of uh, uh, traditionally work together to fund construction of our military facilities and strive to improve the quality of life and care afforded to our veterans and their families. Um, Chairman Culberson continues uh, this tradition as the bill provides funding levels that members on both sides agree are appropriate uh, while avoiding uh, contentious legislative riders that could complicate passage. Uh, on the Mill Con side, the FY15 bill adequately provides for the department's uh, priorities in military construction for each of the services. Uh, if the department needed something, it's in the bill. If they didn't need it, it's not in the bill. On the VA side, the bill meets the discretionary budget request in all areas of administrative expenses, research, medical care, and facilities. And I know a lot of members on this committee and across the Congress are concerned about the claims backlog and the electronic health records. Uh, trust me, the members of uh, our subcommittee, especially Chairman Corberson, uh, and I have spoken with Secretary Shinseki uh, about these issues um, many, many times, and I believe that the bill provides the resources uh, and the accountability uh, needed to address these two problems. And I think that the Chairman has spoken to that. Uh, we are withholding funds. Uh, with that being said, Mr. Chairman, I request that when the bill comes to the floor that it comes with an open rule so that the full House can have a third debate on the uh, FY15 uh, military construction VA bill and hopefully avoid uh, adding contentious uh, policy riders that could complicate passage. Uh, I thank you very much for the time, and I appreciate uh, the support that this committee has given us in making this uh, a great bill for our veterans and our military families. Mr. Bishop, thank you very much. I, I want to direct my question really to both of you because uh, you, you both appear to be as a team to come in here today. This is not unusual. I see Mrs. Lowy when she appears with this uh, young man, Hal Rogers, on a regular basis, and they attempt to try and work together and grapple with the problems and the issues, and not with, notwithstanding whether it's a president that we agree with completely or one that we completely disagree with. That's not the issue. I'm talking about your effort and your work. None of us feel good when we see the things that happen at Walter Reed. None of us feel good about the things that we happen, notwithstanding not the shootings at Fort Hood, but at our uh, military installations or at our VA hospitals. Uh, I'm concerned about the backlogs. I'm concerned about the medical records. I'm concerned about the shape of our medical facilities. What are you doing? to make sure that the next thing is not a surprise. Most important tool we've got, Mr. Chairman, if I could, Sanford, mm -hmm. is uh, the power of the purse. And it really is the, uh, as Sanford said, a, a great way to hold these agencies accountable. And, and we have in, the, in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this bill before you on the electronic medical records, on, um, on frankly, on the reporting requirements that we've got on the claims backlog, we're going to hold the agency accountable. If they want to continue to see their money come forward, they've got to prove to the subcommittee that they're honoring their word to our veterans to ensure a seamless uh, medical records can be read back both ways and the claim backlog is being uh, dealt with. And uh, by the way, also the terrible tragedy in Phoenix, I want to be sure to mention also, yes. Mr. Chairman, we're, we're going to be doing an amendment on the floor to ensure the Inspector General gets additional funding, something Sanford and I both support mm -hmm. to uh, investigate that matter fully 
and to pursue criminal charges where it's appropriate if indeed someone was gaming the waiting list, uh, for example, to, uh, uh, and put veterans' lives and health at risk. Yeah. Mr. Bishop? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, put in this bill, as we did the last bill, uh, we continue to require the Secretary to give us periodic uh, reports, uh, regular reports on the progress in eliminating the backlog. Uh, that's of, of prime importance, and every member uh, gets feedback from our constituents uh, about that backlog, and uh, it's unsatisfactory. Uh, those delays are, are just inappropriate for people who have sacrificed and served for us as they have, and so we are requiring that the Secretary provide uh, reports regularly to, to the committee on the elimination of, of that backlog. Uh, I believe that uh, the carrot and the stick approach is appropriate, and I think that uh, if, if we continue with that, uh, we should get some results. The Secretary continues to assure us that that backlog will be eliminated by 2015. We intend to hold him to that. Yeah. If you want your money, you've got to prove to us that you're meeting your own deadlines and honoring your word and honoring the law if you want to get funded. Works. Of all, all. I might also add, yes, Mr. Chairman, that uh, we, have, we are working with and have discussed with the authorizing committees to have identical language in the authorizing bills as well as the appropriations bills uh, for both defense and for veterans affairs uh, to make sure that all four committees are holding the respective departments, both VA and defense, uh, accountable. Uh, we believe, uh, and I think the chairman and I agree on this, that the, the problem is not so much the Department of Veterans Affairs on the medical records issue as it is uh, the inability to get the Department of Defense to cooperate in this process. Is that right? Yes, sir. And Mr. Chairman Freelihausen, does he concur with that? with that? Yes, and we're going to get together and do it, handle this in a unified way, as Sanford says, mm -hmm. with identical language in our bill, in Mr. Freelingheisen's bill, mm -hmm. and in the NDAA. Well, if I see Mrs. Lowy today, I'm going to ask her that same question, see if she concurs, because I think it's impor important that people do say the, say Man, the same thing. Into this, I know as well. Well, I, I, I just want to make a statement, and we're all allowed to have our own personal viewpoints, but I believe that General Shinsheki is the greatest of all of the uh, cabinet officers himself the way I feel about him, his ethos, his desire, his drive. Uh, I think he's got a tough job. I think, well, they got a lot of problems. But notwithstanding that, he has been there for a long enough period of time where at some point you got to round up all the, you know, the problems and go after them. So I will continue to be nothing but an advocate. I try and be an advocate, mm -hmm. but I also want and believe that what you're doing is focusing on the problems, not saying, you know, everything's going along great, but recognizing we have men and women who have served this great nation who are struggling with the ravages of bringing home war to them and their families, but also trying to get on with their lives that they so well have protected this great nation from. So I'm not going to give up. But I, I respect you, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand there with you, not be a critic of you. And I hope you know that. I hope both of you know that. Uh, I feel that way about my local VA. We all have a local VA. We have things that we have, thoughts and feelings, but we've got to make progress. And I think over time, it's had, you're measured, not over months. So thank you very much. Mr. Bishop? I have no questions other than to express my gratitude for what you do far too often. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida. Gentleman has no question. Gentleman from Oklahoma. The gentleman who had a big birthday yesterday. <laughs> 50 years old, Tom. Mr. Chairman, you have my vote for anything you'd like, yeah, to, uh, <laughs> like to run for. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, it's just good to see both my friends here. And uh, I had the opportunity, obviously, to uh, look at this bill during the course of uh, the full markup. And I just want to comment for the committee. Just uh, what a wonderful bipartisan effort it was. Frankly, uh, 
Uh, my good friend, Mr. Bishop, was crafting amendments, and my good friend, uh, Mr. Culverson, was accepting the amendments since we were trying to refine the language even right to the last minute. So uh, we don't see enough of that around here. Your committee has really been a model of it, and I just want to thank uh, both of you for presenting us such an excellent product and doing it in such a cooperative and bipartisan way. you will back. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. By the way, we, with great respect, recognize every time one of you from the appropriations comes committee comes forward, we always tout our guy, Tom Cole, that I think he has made your committee an even better committee, and he does that certainly for us also. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. The gentleman has no questions. Gen no question. The uh, other birthday uh, young man from Florida, Dan Webster, you're recognized, sir. No question. Chairwoman? No birthdays for me. No birthdays for you. <laughs> Dr. Burgess, you're not allowed to have another birthday, are you? <laughs> no, we're done. Uh, <laughs> gentleman's recognized. I thank the chairman for the recognition. Um, <clears throat> chairman Culberson, I know last year when you were here, we talked about the, and I apologize for being late, but uh, last year when you were here, we talked about the issue of the, uh, the interoperability of electronic medical records between the VA and the Department of Defense. Are we closer to that now? We didn't quite get what we were asking for last year. Are we closer now? Yes, and it's going to happen this year because they don't get their money until they comply with the law and develop an interoperable medical record. And just as in the private sector, if 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 you want to if you want a paycheck, you got to earn it. Works. Well, I'm 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 happy that you've done that. It's been a long time coming, so it's going to happen. I, I thank Make you for sure. doing that. Thank you. I yield back. And I want to also, if I could, for the record, uh, join Mr. Bishop in uh, urging the committee to adopt an open rule. I think it's absolutely the correct thing to do. Give everybody a chance to. Get a part of this debate. Good. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back his time. I see no further member that's requesting your time. Uh, I, I appreciate both of you being here, and I think every single one of us recognize what kind of heavy lift you have on a daily and yearly basis to come. Uh, I, I, I respect what you're doing. I would stay after this, Tiger, because it's got to get done. And if I may help either one of you, in your endeavors, please let me know. I would. It, it's worth my time to do that. Also, you're now without objection. Anything you have, Ryan, will be under the record. But you're now excused. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to call the next panel up, please. I would uh, recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, the uh, Committee on Appropriation, gentleman, Mr. Cole, and also the uh, ranking member, the gentlewoman from uh, New York, Mrs. Lowy. So yes, sir. I voted already, and Mr. Polis is going. Are we going to try to? Uh, is there just one two vote? Votes. Just two votes. Uh, we rotate through it. We can push. You it. know, I, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, as we welcome the new members, we'll be aware that our friends on the Democratic side have announced that they're going to go ahead and make these votes. I'd encourage you to go make your votes. Uh, there are some 400 people that uh, have not voted. I didn't know how much of this we'd get through, but. Uh, Oh, go fast. Okay, but at least we've all been notified. Uh, I want to welcome both of you. As always, I would say to you, Mrs. Lowy, uh, thank you for taking time to be here. Your presence, your uh, voice, your participation in this process of the Rules Committee is most important to members who see you year after year, day after day, with the knowledge of the kind of work that you have to do. I hope it was made better by the the uh, young chairman from Oklahoma who joined you, he represents, I believe, the perspective of balance very well, and we're delighted that both of you are here for the Ledge Branch Appropriations Act of 2015, H.R. 4487. The young chairman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say for the record, this committee is much more intimidating when you're down here looking up uh, than when you're up there looking down. Um, uh, this uh, legislation calls for $3.3 billion uh, to uh, operate the House. As per normal, we uh, make no provision for the Senate. Uh, it, it will be left to deal with its own uh, concerns and uh, spending patterns. There's no increase uh, in this year's budget, and uh, we still operate under a 14 percent reduction from 2011. Uh, legislative funding, the MRAs, the committee fundings, etc., are flat. Uh, the pay freeze for members continues another year. Uh, there is um, uh, 
a reduction uh, in the request from the architect to the capital, uh, about $40 uh, million, but uh, that money is redistributed into other areas, which will go in very quickly. I do want to note that uh, an item we're all concerned with, which is the uh, finishing of the restoration of the dome, is fully funded. This is the last year for that. We also continue the practice that uh, was really begun uh, by my ranking member and a uh, preceding chairman, uh, Ms. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, setting aside money for the Cannon uh, restoration. I think that was a very wise decision when she made it as chairman. I'm very pleased that both parties have continued to support that decision. Uh, there's a modest increase in the various agencies that support the work of the Congress, the GAO, the CBO, Government Printing Office, and the uh, Capitol Police, uh, and they are indeed modest. Uh, the bill is bipartisan and collaborative. Uh, again, I want to praise particularly my ranking member, um, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, who is just absolutely terrific. I don't think there's a single member in this body that knows more about the legislative branch than she does, having served so many years as both its chairman and its ranking member. I want to thank particularly my friend, uh, Mr. Harris, my vice chairman, uh, because of some unusual circumstances and rejuggling. He was actually the only member that we had that was both in the last session and this on our side of the aisle, and uh, that was very valuable to us. The uh, committee members were diligent and wonderful to work with. The ranking member and the chairman, as always, uh, provided valuable input and were very helpful. And finally, we had a terrific staff to get us through. So it's a pretty straightforward bill. When you don't have any new money, you don't have a lot of choices. Uh, and uh, the decisions you have to make uh, become pretty clear. But again, I want to assure my friends uh, they were made in a bipartisan and collaborative sense. And I think we made uh, good decisions with the resources that were at our disposal. Without a yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Ms. Lowe, welcome. We're delighted Thank that you. you're without objection. Anything you have in writing will be there the Thank record. Thank you. And as always, and we're now joined by Mr. McGovern, you get smiles all across this table. <laughs> well, I first want to thank you for your very elegant welcome. It's always a pleasure for yes, me to be here. And to be here with my friend, the birthday boy, is a special delight. And I know I'm a poor substitute for Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and she apologizes in advance because she had to make a very important appearance someplace. Uh, so I'll just make a couple of points quickly. Um, this was a bipartisan effort. We all worked together. Um, and I always appreci appreciate the opportunity to be here with my friend, Mr. Cole. Uh, I support orderly consideration of this bill by the House and note that the bill is traditionally considered under a structured rule. I'm pleased with the bill that Chairman Cole has put forward today, especially given the funding constraints on the subcommittee. The bill provides level funding overall. Unfortunately, the allocation has ensured that there's no increase for member and committee offices, which I regret. I would remind my colleagues that personal office budgets have been cut by 16 percent since 2010, while committees have been cut by 14 percent. Over the same period, it is no coincidence that as staff budgets have contracted, so has comedy production of legislation and morale. Even though I wish we could do more to invest in our staff, I know that the chairman had many competing priorities, and I'm pleased to see an investment in infrastructure. The bill includes funding for the final phase of the Capitol Dome project at $21.2 million. The funding provided this year will address the interior walls, columns, coffered ceiling that have sustained significant water damage, paint, delamination. The bill also continue, continues funding for the House Historic Buildings Revitalization Trust Fund at $70 million. This trust fund will be the main funding source for the Cannon House Office Building Restoration. The estimate to rehabilitate the building has come in at a staggering $753 million. The bill also used savings from completed architect of the Capitol projects to fund inflationary increases for the Capitol Police, Government Accountability Office, the Library of Congress, the Office of Compliance. The Congressional Budget Office was held flat because they received their full budget request in fiscal year 2014, unlike many agencies. Uh, the bill cuts the Open World Leadership Center by 43 percent to $3.4 million while the funding that supports teaching democratic principles to Russians has been eliminated, the committee report encourages the program to do more. 
for exchanges in Ukraine and surrounding regions. Therefore, it is baffling that the bill removes funding in order to penalize Russia rather than shifting funds to support Ukraine and other countries, fostering democratic principles. I know the ranking member of this subcommittee has had a wonderful working relationship with Chairman Cole. He put this bill together, as always, in a thoughtful manner. And all of the members are lucky that we have an institutionalist in his role. He's tried to incorporate the priorities of members on both sides of the aisle. So thank you for the new chair. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here today. Well, I appreciate it. Um, any other comments, Mr. Cole? Yeah. Uh, well, it looks like everybody on the Republican side has walked. Uh, to vote. <laughs> so, uh, this has been the best hearing I've been at ever. <laughs> well, you know, we're so happy we can accommodate. Absolutely. Thank you. No, yeah. <laughs> I just want, let me just say thank you to both of you for, um, for the work you've done. I, I, I regret the allocation too, and I, just, I, just, I say this every time we do this, but um, you know, when you don't invest um, in staff more, um, you end up losing people who have a great institutional minds and who know this place better than any of us do and uh, I think sometimes the end product suffers and I know you have nothing you, that's not your concern here but uh, but I think we, we at some point we got to address this issue of allocations and make sure we don't uh, you know kind of shortchange uh, some of the talent up here on the hill but uh, I thank you for what you've done and um, I have no further questions thank you mr. McGovern mr. Hastings Pardon me? No, no, I have not voted yet. And, and I have no questions, so you may go vote. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Yes, Moran's going to come right back if you could. Right, and Mr. Mr. Gosar is going to come back also. So we'll we'll adjourn to the call of the chair All right. until they get back from voting. All right. Thank you. Just trying to keep you moving. <clears throat> I may as well go down and make the next vote then. Uh, you'll be done for a while. I don't think they're. Oh, they don't go. Yeah, that's 210, 207. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Moran, we're glad to have you here. Uh, a little change at the chair, so uh, if you would, please proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Chair. We, uh, uh, and I'll try to make this quick, but I am asking that uh, my amendment be made in order uh, tomorrow. Uh, I, I don't expect it to, uh, to pass, but I do think it's an issue that uh, should be raised on the House floor, no matter how unpopular it might be among our constituents. There's a serious issue here. and uh, What my amendment would do is to give a very modest uh, housing stipend, $25 a day, just for the days that we're in legislative session. Uh, that would come to exactly 2800 which is exactly what the, uh, uh, the salary adjustment would have equaled if we weren't freezing our salary for the sixth year in a row. Uh, it only is available for people who live more than 50 miles away from D.C. And, of course, you can't uh, increase your own salary during the same term that you're elected for. I'm retiring, so it wouldn't affect me, and I only live 10 miles from the Capitol. Uh, but... Um, 
uh, I think we should uh, find ways to inform our constituents, no matter how uh, they, much they may not want to realize this, it's very difficult for a lot of members uh, to maintain two residences. Uh, we, um, and what, what's going to happen when you put this bill, which it has for the first time in the ledge branch, I think it's going to be very difficult to ever get it out. Neither party is going to want to. Uh, and uh, so we could go for 5, 10, 20 years. And so what happens? Well, what you have is a majority of the Congress who are either going to be independently wealthy uh, or members who will only stay for one or two terms and basically cash out. And that doesn't uh, serve the interests of our country. We need people who are willing to stay long enough to understand uh, the issues. And, and uh, we're not going to have people in their 30s and 40s with kids and a mortgage to support and student loans to pay and, um, and, and all the other expenses being able to maintain two residences. DC's uh, rental costs uh, on average are 27000 a year. Uh, they've gone up 12% uh, just in the last few years. And our pay has gone down by 19% because we've been freezing it at a time when inflation uh, reduces the, uh, the buying power. So um, I think this is something that, uh, that should be raised. I'm more than happy to have members voting against it and taking credit for voting against it. I fully understand that. Uh, but I, I may be in a somewhat unique position where uh, we can raise it, inform the public, and then take the consequences, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Mr. McGovern, I'd just say if my wife were here, she'd say thank you. <laughs> my children would say thank you. My mother would say thank you. No, I, I think you raise a, a very good point. I mean, we, 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 we have a habit here of, of, uh, of, of, of constantly railing against ourselves. It, and I think it contributes to the cynicism that people have when it comes to Congress. And, uh, and I, do, I do worry about the fact that this will become a millionaire's club at some point. And, um, and whether people want to vote for your amendment or not, I hope it's made in order, and um, you know, and uh, let's, let's see where the votes are. But thank, thank you. you, thank you, Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, and Mr. Moran, thank you for raising all this issue. I genuinely hope uh, that the committee allows uh, that it be uh, voted on, and I, for one, would vote for it. I'd be interested if you are interested in, and I haven't had an opportunity to speak with you before now, um, but. Um, there's another uh, subset to this, and that is the fact that we receive a $3,000 a year tax credit. I don't know the exact amount of time, but I believe, um, I, I know the 21 years that I'm here, it has been the same $3,000 tax credit. And I believe that it dates back as many as 28 years a $3,000 tax credit. So um, as we sit here, I'm curious if you would be offended, and I don't know that it helps or hurts um, or your amendment, but if I were to make an oral uh, amendment to your amendment to increase the tax credit to $10,000. Uh, I, I thought about that, Mr. Hastings. I, I would certainly support it. I think it, that may have to come under ways and means, All right. and, so, and that's why uh, we are trying to uh, affect that even by a cost All right. of living increment. All right. But well, then returning to your situation, and I, I'm I'm not a, 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 a crybaby when it comes to um, um, money, um, uh, and I recognize that the job that we have is a critically important one in our society. But if you look at the makeup of the Congress over the course of the last 20 years, it has grown more and more um, uh, into the number ranks of those who are, are fairly well off. Uh, the latest people that are coming here are multimillionaires when they come here. Now, if I use myself just as a for example, um, all of my children are grown and working. Um, my mother is deceased and I'm single. Um, I live here, I lived uh, in your district in Alexandria for a period of time, and I paid uh, at Fox Chase at that time, and this is uh, eight years ago, I paid $1,600 a month uh, for a one-bedroom apartment there. So over uh, 3000 now per month. Yeah, and, and the bridge ate my life, so I moved back here to Capitol Hill, 
And then I wound up paying $1,900 to live in the building across from uh, the taco place over there. I can't think of the name of the building. But I live there, and a lot of members do, uh, largely because of walking distance. So then as I grow older, I decided, Chuck, you know, I don't have anything else uh, uh, to concern myself about. So I moved into the Senate Square building near Union Station, which is a four-year-old building, and I moved in when it was new. All things considered, I moved in and my rent was $2,100. It is now $2,600. I pay $1,680 for a three-bedroom, two-bath house in Florida. Uh, and when all of that adds up, it's close, it is $4,200 a month uh, from my salary. Um, and uh, when you when you look at it from that standpoint and you plug in telephone, electric, water, and the other circumstances, I'm well over the margin that a person should be uh, for living expenses. I'm over 50 percent of uh, my pay. That's just one member. There are others here. And then we have the horror of members living in their offices. And that just, uh, they, 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 some are living there because they have to and some others just uh, choose uh, uh, that way of living. Uh, but I, don't, I, I make no bones about the fact that we should have had um, uh, appropriate pay increases and member representational allowance increases. So I'm fully supportive, and at the very least, if no one but Mr. Moran and I are courageous enough uh, to vote for uh, his amendment, uh, then I think it ought to be on the floor, and I fully support it being made in order, and I hope it is so that we can vote on this tomorrow. I'm going to be managing the rule, and I'll talk more about it, and I agree with Mr. McGovern wholeheartedly. We beat ourselves down here in this institution. I saw one of the amendments uh, by a fine young representative uh, to disallow members from uh, using members' representational allowance for first class. You may remember a fellow that came here named Earl Fingerhut uh, from Cleveland. He began a part of this march on uh, uh, taking away so-called perks from members. He wanted to take away the mileage that members accumulate in their airline. And some people at that time living in California, Oregon, Arizona, and what have you, they couldn't bring their families here if they didn't have the accumulated mileage uh, other than at prohibitive expenses. Uh, we've done ourselves a terrible disservice by eating up the institution or having the institution eat itself. And you speak clearly as you exit, um, and I'm uh, deeply grateful to you as a member and friend uh, for bringing to the attention of uh, this body. And I heard the comments uh, I w when you were on television, uh, when you made uh, uh, your statement regarding this particular legislation. And two or three people um, that were walking in the streets had some comment about it. And uh, here again, you can hear the disparaging notions about Congress. We take our work real seriously here, and I don't think anybody here is not worth that $174,000. And like you say, what's going to happen is uh, like you're leaving here having not had a raise for four years. If you come back to visit with us, as I'm sure you will four years from now, we will not have had a raise. Uh, but the people who are wealthy who are coming here are going to return this institution to what it started with. And I remind people, great founders that they were, they were all, for the most part, property individuals. And people talk about what they did uh, that was so great. Among the things that they did that were not so great is they would not even allow their brother or their mother to vote if they didn't have no property. And women couldn't vote at all. So in the long haul, if we return to that elitist structure, and several of them struck a chord in their exchanges in developing uh, the Constitution for this country, it didn't mean for us to be in sackcloth and ashes um, in order uh, to be able to represent people. So when all is said and done, um, I, I, if, if only two of us stand, then I'll be standing with you. And if they don't make the amendment in order, I'm going to talk about it as if it were made in order anyhow. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the gentleman's comments. Gentleman, Mr. Woodall. Gentleman, gentleman does not seek time. Gentleman, Mr. Polis. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moran. Uh, in, in my mind, the issue is, um, uh, is intertwined with 
uh, whether people think Congress is worth it, are they doing a good job? Currently, Congress has a very low approval rating. I think if <clears throat> Congress was balancing the budget, was addressing our immigration issues and, and solving issues that people cared about, I think there'd be a different public mood uh, on, a, on a, an issue like this. Um, but uh, justified or not, uh, currently, uh, this body is not held in high esteem uh, by the people of the country. Um, I could not, uh, on behalf of my constituents, be in a position to support uh, this amendment. I, I'm fine with it being made in order. Uh, members should certainly be able to vote their consciences, but I hope that this body becomes a model of efficacy and productivity uh, such that the people of the country are proud uh, to invest more, not only uh, in, uh, in members, but in, in the institution in terms of staff and some of the severe cutbacks that have occurred to our own ability uh, of each office as well as leadership staff, committee staff, uh, to be lawmakers for the country. But uh, given the uh, record of, of this body under uh, Republican leadership the last two sessions, um, uh, we are currently not in a place where I think that uh, it's appropriate to go to the American people and ask for more. And I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for his comments. And uh, Jim, I want to, uh, as you and I were walking down the stairs to vote a few minutes ago, I think I forthrightly told you that I would say publicly what I said to you privately, and that is that I, I do think that your words, I don't need to call it courage, it, it, it's, it's a feeling that you see. You see it a day in and day out with the struggle that members make uh, into our sixth year now. Perhaps it will end up being seven and eight, I don't know. Uh, of going without even a COLA increase. It is, uh, it is a, an amazing thing that we are trying to work through. I know, I believe federal judges are going through similar circumstances. While they have different circumstances, they still have circumstances. Uh, and I, I think it is something that should be addressed at the levels uh, here in the Congress, I, and I, I'm not admonishing you. Don't take it that way. But I, I do believe that your leadership should meet with a Republican leadership, and come up with, and craft ideas about not just members of Congress because it's really not members of Congress. It's the institution. It is not just members of Congress. It's our staff. It's the way that we see ourselves and to work ourselves through some. Uh, problems that we have. This is a problem. But we also need to remember that there are federal judges, federal magistrates that are going through similar circumstances. I am not a lawyer, but my father was a federal judge for 14 or 16 years, and he spoke clearly with me about the trials and tribulations of them being stuck with members of Congress. I don't know the current status of any negotiation. What I would say to you is, is that I do recognize this. I would also say that as the chairman of this committee, I'm having a look at what would also be a fair accommodation, the general manner of dealing with the federal judges also, and not just ourselves. And so I, I admire what you're doing. We're gonna, I'm going to have to decide what we're going to do here right now. I do not see this as being something that will be made in order. We'll see what the committee thinks. But what I would tell you is, and I think Mr. Hastings know this, I will look at you and say the same thing, that I believe that there has to be some understanding about what we're going to do, because we are losing federal judges every day. Some of our brightest and best young Americans, men and women, uh, are finding their service to the country dwindling as a result of their needs. They come in young and then have children, college, other accommodations. So I, I, I do want to thank you for being here. And like I said, I don't think it's a bravery issue. I think it's an honesty issue. And for you to honestly, honestly approach us about this issue is Mr. important. Chairman, would you yield just a moment? You I, I and would, Mr. Moran, I think, need to vote on this second vote. 
I, I would uh, do that, and I see that we've now had more people come in. So, uh, Ms. Moran, I'm going to go ahead. I don't see Mr. Gozar, and I don't see Mr. Holt. Uh, so I would like to say that the committee is going to be in recess until we uh, come back in about 15 minutes. But well, all of us have already voted. Well, but you have no witnesses. Uh, okay. That's good. Then close That's the That's all I'm suggesting. <laughs> you want, you want to hold court? Maybe they don't want to come. Well, okay. So we're, we're, the committee, committee will be in recess for 15 minutes. Okay. Well, but there's no witnesses here. Yeah, we close here. You got the no witnesses. No, we're, we're waiting for two more. They should have been here. Go vote, Pete. Yeah, go vote. Well, we'll now come to order, and thank you very much. We uh, do now have our witnesses who is appearing, and I apologize to the gentleman, Mr. Moran. Both he and I missed that vote. Uh, and uh, like to say official business kept us away, but uh, I, I apologize very much for that by not paying atten being attentive to that and saving my own soul, too. Uh, Mr. Gozar, we're delighted uh, that you are here, and we've been... Uh, waiting for you, and we're delighted that you're here to uh, speak to us. Gentlemen from uh, Arizona, as always, uh, we're delighted that you're here. If you'll turn on that microphone, make sure that green light's on, and without objection, anything you have in writing will Go be through all record. Of them. Sir? Go through all of them. Uh, yes, sir. For whatever, if you were here for, the, we still have both sections open, H.R. 4486, Military Construction and Veteran Affairs and Related Agencies, and also H.R. 4487, Ledge Branch. So I believe the gentleman's here from Ledge, 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 Ledge Branch. Branch. Yeah, I am. The gentleman's recognized. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the First Amendment is, is um, looking at to prohibit funds for the first class travel. Uh, this is on Ledge Branch. Um, I just think this is a, a, a good aspect in regards to that, um, the legislative branch to consider. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by this effort by Representative Walter Jones, Raul Ruiz, and, and John Barrow. Efficient travel to and from congressional districts contributes uh, to effective execution of the Constitution and official duties of members of Congress. As with all federal fund spending, members' representative allowances funds are taxpayer dollars. As such, the use of these funds must be exercised with the utmost efficiency and transparency. A loophole currently exists that allows members of Congress to fly first class at the expense of the taxpayer. Members of Congress are public servants of the people and shouldn't be considered a privileged class. As such, we must be judicious with the travel expenses that are paid with federal funds. Luxury airfare accommodations utilizing taxpayer monies would seem inappropriate in any fiscal climate, but in a time of soaring deficits and with federal debt in excess of $17 trillion, such, such expenditures especially, seem especially wasteful. If federal restrictions prohibit members of our military from traveling first class, this same standard should also apply to members of Congress. If members choose to fly first class, the difference in the amount should be paid out of their own money. And I fully recognize uh, what the, the committee is under and would like to see adoption of that common sense amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gozar, 
the, this comes out of the jurisdiction of the House administration, is that correct? I believe so. Uh, Ms. Gozart, you're the one that has given testimony. Yes. And I do appreciate you having staff here, and if he needs to come kneel beside you to help you with giving advice, that's fine. The gentleman is, is not allowed to give testimony. Thank you. Mr. Gozart, is the jurisdiction in the House administration? Yes. Have you approached them about this issue? Um, my, we did approach the, uh, the, the House uh, administration in regards to this, yes. And what was their answer? Um, they said that there could be a savings on this, but... Um, uh, they chose not to act? Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Bishop, are there any questions from uh, my friends that are on the Democrat side? See, no question, uh, questions from the Republican side. Mr. Grosar, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, and if anything you have in writing, if you'll leave for us, we'd appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking time to be with us today. I have four others. Oh, excuse me. The gentleman's <laughs> recognized for those two. Excuse me. I'm um, sorry. I do know you're a, a, a busy, thoughtful guy. And you dentists do good work. Duties in the detail. Yes, sir. And the second one, Mr. Chairman, I have is my amendment reduces the amount provided for the Wor Open World Leadership Center Trust Fund account by $3.42 million and transfers the funds to the spending reduction account. In fiscal year 2014, this program received $6 million. The committee reports that out of this amount, 43% went to supporting participants from Russia. As you know, Russia is the leading instigator of tensions and turmoil in Ukraine. And so I agree with the committee report that says we should no longer offer these exchanges to Russian officials. But moreover, the Open World Leadership Center Trust Fund is a duplicative of several other programs that exist within the State Department. We need to terminate this program that provides no benefit to hard-working tax, hard taxpayers. A similar amendment passed in the fiscal year 2013 Legislative Branch Appropriation Act. Since 2000, the Open World Leadership Center Trust Fund has received nearly $200 million from the federal government to pay for government officials from foreign countries to visit the United States. Democrats and Republicans have been trying to eliminate this pro program since 2009, and I would like to build upon this bipartisan effort and zero out this unnecessary duplicative account. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, may proceed. The third one I have is um, this would prohibit spending on portraits of bureaucrats and members of Congress. According to ABC News and the Washington Times, the Obama administration has spent approximately 400000 on commission portraits of agency directors and cabinet secretaries in the last two years. This includes a nearly $40,000 portrait of former EPA administrator Lisa Jackson. The waste is not limited to the Obama administration, however, and both parties have engaged in this type of wasteful spending over the years. Under the Bush administration, a portrait painted of former EPA administrator Stephen Johnson cost almost 30000 At the time of soaring debts and deficits at $17 trillion, such expenditures seemed very wasteful, particularly in, in light of the hard-earned taxpayers' money. This concept already has bipartisan support. Senators Jeannie Sheehan and Tom Coburn from Oklahoma have introduced legislation which would prohibit this practice government-wide. A similar provision was also included last year's omnibus appropriation bill that was signed into law. Once again, I understand the full difficulty of this, chair, of this uh, committee, but would like to have that as well. Thank you very much. Gentlemen's recognized. The fourth one I have is, is um, um, this would reduce the funding of the Botanical Gardens to the levels appropriate in 2014. I would like to say that I appreciate the Botanical Gardens and its beauty. As an outdoorsman and gardener, I have visited this beautiful place many times and always learn and see something new. In fact, recently I saw the, uh, the, the Congressional Fox. Most members of Congress are often faced with difficult choices, especially given our current fiscal crisis. These programs that are not constitutionally mandated and other programs that are nice, but they're not constitutionally mandated. This is one program that's nice, but cannot be immune from the fiscal pressures facing our government. My amendment is not intended to denigrate the Botanical Garden. However, I am concerned that the architect of the Capitol has proposed over 5.1 million on new capital projects at the Botanical Garden this year. And at a time of soaring deficits and federal debt at $17 trillion, I don't think this is quite pertinent and prudent. It's a wonderful attraction. Congress must, see, must seek to limit these and have prudent oversight on. Thank you very much. One more. Gentlemen, have further amendments? I do. Gentlemen's recognized. Uh, this is um, to uh, amend the budget in regards to books for the blind and physically handicapped program. 
My amendment funds the Books for the Blind and Physically Handicapped program at the fiscal year 2015 budget re request level. The amendment pays for this increase by reducing the salaries and expenses of the House of the Minority Floor Leader to the same amount provided to the Office of the Speaker. The Books for the Blind and Physically Handicapped program is administered by the National Library Services and provides critical services for blind and handicapped residents throughout the United States. Since 1931, the NLS has successfully administered the national reading programs for the U.S. citizens. The program allows for the, produ allows for the production of the books and magazines in Braille and other recorded formats and then distributes them throughout a nationwide network of 56 regional and 65 sub-regional libraries. My amendment funds this worthy program at the fiscal year 2015 budget request, same as the President. Currently, the underlying bill provides $6.65 million for the Office of the Speaker and provides $7.11 million for the Office of the Minority Floor Leader. Regardless of what party it is, is in power, the Office of the Minority Floor Leader should not be appropriate the same money should not be appropriated more money than the Office of the Speaker. My amendment makes this funding level for these two offices exactly the same. The nonpartisan Congressional Budgetary Office has estimated my amendment will have no impact on the spending and budgetary authority. Thank you very much. Further discussion from the gentleman concerning the amendments that he proposes? No, I'm all done with my... Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gozar, I have a question going back to your discussion about the portraits. Mm -hmm. You had uh, spoken very eloquently, and I just was catching up with you, that there had been provisions that were in the omnibus package. What did those, what did that language speak to and do at that time? Okay. Yeah, it prohibited um, any funds for portraits um, government-wide. So there was a one-year mm -hmm. provision. And so what you're now saying is on for this fiscal year, you would Con continue. continue that. Yes. Interesting. Mr. Bishop. I have just one question that I should know the answer and have to admit stupidity that I don't. Who officially owns and runs the botanical gardens? Is that under... Who, Say that again. Who actually owns the botanical... Who runs the botanical gardens? Is that under the architect or is it under the architect park service? The capital. It's part of the architect. Okay. And is, is the reflecting pool now also under the architect as well? I think it is. Okay. Can't be that for sure. Thank you. Like I say, I should have known that. I didn't. Sorry. I'm not sure I did either. Thank you very much. I think all grounds and buildings are under their jurisdiction. Uh, buildings and grounds are under their jurisdiction. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Someone's recognized. I, I wanted to sort of put your mind at rest about members of Congress. I just had to put the arm on everybody I know to help me pay, including my good friends here, to pay for a portrait because I wanted a woman up there on that wall. Uh, but the money all came from, from, none of it came from MRA or any public money at all. I don't, as far as I know, that's always been uh, the way it operates here for members. Yeah. I don't think that's, un, that's necessarily true based upon budgetary projections and oversight. Well, they sure made it clear to us. I mean, there was no question about it. The money we were going to use for portrait had to be raised from friends and acquaintances and relatives and uh, every dime of it, which was... Uh, very generous I, of people. I'm talking about the if, if I could. Sure. I, I, what I heard Mr. Gozar say, he is here, is that the administration. No, I think he said public officials and members of Congress as well, right? Um, what I said is, is um, um, we prohibit spending on portraits of bureaucrats and members of Congress. Okay. I think that's already prohibited on Congress. Um, that this is, includes portraits of bureaucrats. I don't this consider is administrative. Okay. Well, well, would that be? Would that be if I could continue yeah, sure. uh, my my yeah. dialogue with the gentleman, S sir? Is that considered under ledge branch, which this is that those would be ledge legislative branch yes. bureaucrats? Yes. It would be. Okay. So seems like we'd agree. I yield back to the uh, gentleman. No, that's that's all right. I'm just going to say that it was, it was very specific and quite clear. What we can do, and then after we we pay for it with all the help we can get, it belongs to the capital. 
-hmm. And as far as I know, they're treating all of us the same. Do you believe that that's not so? Um, I want to make sure that it is so. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this hurts having this amendment be in there to tighten up the language. Okay. Well, all right. Whatever. Gentlemen, it was back our time. A uh, gentleman from uh, Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate my friend from Arizona for, for being here. He's been working on this botanic garden uh, issue uh, from the day we, uh, we arrived, and I I think it's worth noting uh, that uh, you're not asking to abolish the botanic gardens. You're not uh, saying that they have no national value. In fact, you had some very laudatory things to say about them. You only said in these tough economic times you'd like to freeze next year's spending at, at last year's uh, uh, spending. Absolutely. I hope we'll be able to, uh, to make that uh, in order. I, I was looking... Uh, I stare at these portraits uh, for most of our Rules Committee uh, uh, days here. I'm glad to know that I'm going to have a new one to look at that will make me smile in ways that these will not uh, make me smile. I, I look forward to the gentlelady from New York uh, uh, being there. But I was just looking on the Senate uh, side, uh, 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 S. Uh, 1820, um, uh, uh, Senator Shan's uh, uh, bill does exactly the same thing, prohibits money uh, from being spent on portraits of members of Congress. So uh, if, uh, if, in fact, uh, we have successfully done away with that, it is, uh, it is uh, not something that is well known and certainly could be something that codification could, uh, uh, could uh, ensure. Um, I, if, uh, if we're willing to go around and ask for money for our re-election campaigns, we should certainly be willing to go around and ask for money uh, for our put our face up on the wall larger than life uh, campaigns. That would seems like a fair uh, a fair uh, source. And I, I don't put this in the category of, of institution bashing. I agree with my friend from Florida that there's entirely too much institution uh, uh, bashing uh, uh, that uh, that goes on. Um, but in times when families back home are making choices. Many of them never thought they would have to make, making choices where they said, I've been playing by the rules all my life and, and uh, things weren't supposed to turn out this way. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly seems like uh, our obligation is not just to do what we can, uh, but to do uh, uh, even more. Uh, and I, I'm grateful to you for, uh, for bringing those, uh, uh, those, uh, uh, all of those bills here, and I hope we'll, uh, minutes here, and I hope we'll be able to, uh, to help bring some of those to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Hey, gentlemen, yields back time. Uh, uh, further questions for the gentleman from Arizona? I, gentleman, sorry. I, I just say, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I'd be curious to find out from the office of the architect. I mean, on the botanic gardens, I, I don't, I have no idea whether that structure is about to cave in or whether it's in good shape or whether it needs some money or whether it doesn't. I mean, I, I mean, how, how do we? How do you, I mean? You know, I mean, I just, I just, I mean, whatever. I mean, I, I just, it would seem to me that, um, you know, I mean. If there's an increase in, in spending somehow, that I would assume it's justified. Someone's justified it somehow, rather than just because they like the flowers. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've walked through there many times myself, but it's a pretty old, old place. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, and, and sometimes you know when you neglect upkeep, uh, it costs ten times as much to fix things when they fall apart. So I, I so I have no basis to make that. Maybe you're an expert on the botanic gardens. Um, but uh, I'm not, um, and so we'll, I'll, I'll check with the office of the architect to have them explain to me, you know. Uh, I can give you an example. Yeah. Uh, in one of the roofs, it has a couple leaks, and instead of fixing the leaks, they want to tear down the whole roof and replace the whole roof. Well, in the long run, that may be cheaper. I mean, uh, it's, just like, it's, I mean it's, like, it's like a house. I mean, I could fix leak by leak by leak by leak on my roof, but at some point, I'm going to have to replace my roof. It might sometimes be cheaper. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. I'm just, I just raise it. And I, and I just also say one, one other thing, too. Yeah, families have to make difficult decisions. Some of those difficult decisions have been forced upon them by decisions that we have made here. You know, there are millions of people who unemployment checks have run out. Uh, they're in a real difficult position because we haven't decided to uh, extend their unemployment. You've got people working full-time on a minimum wage, still living in poverty. They're, 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 they're having hard times and tough choices because we won't raise, vote to raise the minimum wage. So, you know, I... I, I get what you're trying to do. I just, it's just kind of nitpicky, and I don't, I don't just, you know. And to be honest, I, I learned something new. I didn't know I could actually buy a first class ticket um, on, uh, with my MRA. I mean, I thought, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess you're a frequent flyer. Sometimes they bump you up, but I didn't know you could actually buy a first class. I never, I never knew that was even a possibility for any of our, of our offices. But I just learned, I learned something, and 
and I, I certainly don't believe in people being purchasing first-class tickets with taxpayer money, but uh, I didn't even know that was even an option. So, uh, believe it or not, it is. And and in the botanical gardens, it's not about just replacing the the roof. It's to do a state-of-the-art vegetative supported roof. And why why not? This is the nation's capital. I want I want this to be the best botanic gardens in the entire world. And I think I think you know, what we should I, just, I, I think we should instill that uh, private funds should be solicited to actually do that. Yeah, whatever I'm, you know I. Anyway, I, I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and appreciate the gentleman being here. Can I? I should know the answer to this, but I don't. I thought I would have thought that the. Funding for the staff of the office of the minority leader would not be higher than the office of the speaker. Is that actually the way These it are is? The actual numbers. What, and can you tell me the actual numbers? I'll tell you the actual numbers. The speaker gets six point six five million dollars. The minority leader gets seven point one one million dollars. The majority leader gets two point one eight million. That's a startling fact, and I was, not, startling fact. I was not aware of it. And I, well, the I thank yield, you for bringing it to the gentleman yield. No, I'll be happy to yield. My, my understanding is that the, the reason why uh, there is that discrepancy is because in the majority, the speaker uh, and the majority league both get their gets separate budgets. In the minority, the speaker's budget is for the speaker and for the minority leader. So that's a little, that's a little, uh, that's a fact that's kind of missing from this debate here. But so there's, there's a difference. Uh, and how the money's allocated. You, you, I, my understanding is how they want to allocate their budget. So you, you're only referring to the people who work on the floor? Is that correct? I don't think so. I think the floor staff? It, this is the full office of the minority leader, the office uh -huh. of the speaker, and the office of the majority leader. This is their budget for those positions. Did you say something about the floor staff? That, that includes all of that. All right. So you did not, your amendment did not just pertain to the floor staff. This this is for the full budget underneath those positions. Yeah. Generally, yeah. you, you, you'll. Well, sure. Yeah. Just, well, actually, I'm just trying to get any figures here. That the, 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 major, that the speaker um, and, the, and the majority get, get their own separate budgets at $12.6 million for total for the Republican leadership. Democratic leadership gets $10 million. Uh, so this notion that somehow, the you know, that the, the the, the Dem Democratic minority leader is you know, getting more. That, that, that's for both the um, you know the speaker and the, uh, the minority leader and you know and, and her leadership staff. So um, I, th th this is this is an issue that doesn't exist in terms of uh, discrepancies. So I appreciate. Uh, I thank the gentleman from Texas for raising that question. According to staff uh, that we looked at, the speaker is paid 6.65 million. Minority leader 7.11 million and majority leader 2.18 million. Those are the numbers. Well, I, I, if I could just, you know, this. Uh, majority leader, right, right, but right. The, the, the republic, the leadership in the House, the, the majority, has a number of separate budgets. All right. Um, whereas, and when you add them up. You, well, I can see when you add them up, and according to this, would be right. eight. But, but, Eight point uh, eight three million, and the minority leader was seven point one one. But I don't see how the minority leader should be getting any more than the majority leader, or much less the speaker. Well, well, I, 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 I mean, this is probably not worth carrying on here. I, I think I think your facts are wrong on this, and I'd, I'd be happy to share with you this information after the hearing. Well, we'd be happy to to look at the facts, but according Just to... Just reclaiming my time, I do want to thank the gentleman for bringing this to our attention. I think it is important, yes. and I hope, uh, I hope it's, uh, we'll pursue it before we, we have the vote on the floor, and I'll yield back. Gentlemen, we'll take additional time. Gentlemen, gentlemen, yields back time. Thank you very much. Mr. Hastings, do you have any questions? I, I was listening to this discussion. And Mr. Kosal, I'm I'm informed that with reference to the portraits, that there's only one in the Capitol Hall, and that is the Gabriel Zimmerman, the gentleman that was shot um, at the time that 
our, our former colleague, uh, Gabby Giffords, was shot. There's a portrait of him here, and your legislation would apply specifically um, uh, to that kind of uh, uh, situation. But all the rest, um, if it's any different, then I want Miss Slaughter to give me my money back. Because I, 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 I... Good luck. <laughs> and the other thing is, I would appeal... <laughs> I would appeal to you, um, like Mr. Woodall says, I look at the portraits uh, here, and I had the good fortune of knowing um, three of those people and getting to know, perhaps to the surprise of some, Jerry Solomon extremely well and travel with him around the world uh, on two different occasions as well as other places. And it gives me a, a feeling of pride. It, it, uh, if what you're saying is that you can't use the money like that um, for these uh, portraits, then I would say just the opposite, that we should be um, commemorating um, icons uh, uh, that um, are served here. And certainly that would be true of uh, Joe Moakley and uh, Claude Pepper uh, and the other uh, gentleman who I do not know, but I think it gives this uh, aura uh, to what we do here at the Capitol, uh, uh, a good uh, feeling. Turning to the botanical uh, gardens, there are several aspects uh, of what's happening there in terms of the decaying uh, facilities. But more important, it's a question, isn't it, of where are our values? Um, citizens come from all over the world. Uh, and all over our nation uh, to see the botanical uh, our gardens. And I would want them to be, as Mr. McGovern said, um, the best example. And why, why, why put ourselves in a position of having a, a, a weed-infested um, uh, place um, uh, that could conceivably come about if it's not cared for properly. I, 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 don't, I don't understand the um, nitpicking about uh, uh, these kinds of things. And I, uh, just to say to you, you could go through the whole budget and find a, a lot of things that you could find a million dollars here or two million dollars there. But I got news for you. You're not going to save this country with those small chunks. And I'm just curious when you and your party are going to be prepared to do the things that are necessary on the big chunks uh, that would help uh, this nation. Um, and uh, so I, I, I just make that as a comment. I, I personally don't see any harm in us spending money at the Botanical Gardens. Um, following the line of how we eat ourselves here at this institution, when I came here, you could actually or uh, on loan have flowers in your office, and it made the place look better uh, to have uh, 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 the flora there. You could actually have paintings in your office that came from um, uh, the Smithsonian. Uh, and I, 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 I don't understand how that gets to be a bad thing. I just don't. And I don't understand how the botanical gardens is even a part of our consideration uh, about, uh, I think Mr. Braun's amendment reduces their budget by $3 million or uh, more. I don't understand that. Well, I believe in trust as a series of promises kept. And at $17 trillion, I have to look at my kids and say, listen, what did you inherit for $55,000 of debt? There's got to be a reality check. And number two is, is you know, I know the beauty of a, of a flower, but where's the beauty of a smile and service? That's what we're here. We're servants of the people. We've got something wrong in this country when we don't look at, at building trust built on small things and incremental. Teach people about budgets. That's what you're doing here is about budgets. It is about nitpicking. I've been a business owner and a dentist for 25 years. It is all about pennies, saving here and there. Because I understand compound interest. It works the other way when you have debt. It compound interest eats you alive. 
And when this country realizes when interest rates come back to where they should be historically, we're in a heap of trouble. So this is one of those things is rewarding. As, as little as it is, it is something. It is a gesture of good faith to the American taxpayer. So would you shut the botanical garden? I, that's, not, that's not what I did. I what asked, I did, would you? No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And that's why I came forward with a plan that's different than, than uh, my, co my colleague, Mr. Brown, because I find benefit. I'm happy to sit out there, and when I do my walks, I actually try to weed, because that's something be beautiful about the gardens. I look at it as something therapeutic. I pull weeds by going one bureaucrat, two bureaucrat, three bureaucrat, bureaucrat four, because maybe I'm solving something. Well, I, I, I hear you, and I would, uh, you know, did you just say that you asked what would your children be getting for that $17 million? Absolutely. Well, I would ask you to ask your children what did they get for the $1 trillion that we spent in Iraq that we didn't have to spend and we wouldn't be having this discussion about a botanical garden had we not blown that kind of money for nothing. What did your children get for us being in Iraq? Well, what, what, did, what did my children get, our children get, when we had no guts to talk about Social Security and Medicare reforms as well? I mean, that's what we've done over and over again, and that's a pittance into the liability. I think aspect. those things should be a part of uh, our overall discussion. And I also think uh, that the reform of the tax structure uh, would cover some of these things. But uh, perhaps we see things um, um, uh, with a, a different eye. But I would prefer our capital. When I ride around this place, and um, I, if I lived here, I would try to own myself a uh, shock absorber uh, company. Uh, when I see all the potholes in this joint all around uh, this city, and I would prefer to see it as the shining city on the hill uh, rather than um, uh, the kind of rundown, uh, dilapidated structure that we are allowing for. Perhaps we aren't as far apart as it sounds, uh, but uh, I'll vote against your amendments if they're made in order, and if I had the power to not make them in order, I wouldn't because I think in the final analysis uh, it just adds to the notion of uh, the deterioration of this as an institution rather than the uplift of the institution itself. And on the subject of the private uh, funding, I'm not so sure constitutionally that can be done. I've made the argument that a new office building is needed. Several new office buildings are needed in this joint, and they aren't going to be built ever. Uh, and I said, well, then why don't we let people like um, Gates and the Koch brothers, and if they wanted to have that name on something around here, Fine. If they would build a building, it can't be done constitutionally, interestingly enough. And I, I ran into that problem. But I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. Further questions for the gentleman from Arizona? Seeing none. Mr. Gozar, thank you very much for You're taking welcome. time thank to you, be able to stay. We appreciate it. And I hope you left <coughs> us anything that you had in writing. This now closes the uh, hearing portion for the two bills that we had in front of us, H.R. 4486, Military Construction, Veterans Affairs and Related Agencies, Appropriations Act 2015, and H.R. 4487, Legislative Branch Appropriations Act 2015. The uh, chairman now needs to advise members that it is going to take a few minutes for us to finalize the uh, package uh, to have it ready for the Rules Committee, and so we will be in recess at least till 5 o'clock, but I would anticipate that at 5 o'clock we will then give another time that we will be back. And I apologize for the inconvenience, but making sausage today is a little bit more difficult. Any further questions? Seeing none, we will be in recess till the call of the chair.
Rules Committee of Kimberly, thank you very much for rejoining us as we uh, reconstitute the committee. The uh, chairman will be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Utah. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 4486, the Military Construction Veteran Affairs and Related Agency Appropriation Act 2015, an open rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. The rule waives all points of order against the consideration of the bill. The rule, the rule waives points of order against provisions <coughs> in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule provides that the bill should be considered for amendment. Uh, under the five-minute rule, the rule authorizes the chair to accord priority and recognition to members who have pre-printed their amendments in the congressional record. The rule provides one motion to recommit with without instruction. Section 2 of the rule provides for consideration of H.R. 4487, the Legislative Branch Appropriation Act 2015. Under a structured rule, the rule provides one hour of general debate on the bill, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill and provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule makes in order only those amendments to H.R. 4487 printed in the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the uh, report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and opponent. Shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to the demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendment printed in the report. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 3 of the rule provides the pending of, a, of the adoption, provides that pending the adoption of a concurrent resolution on the budget for fiscal year 2015. The amounts provided for the current law mandatory budget authority and outlays contain in the statement of the chair of the committee on the budget of the House of Representatives and the Greshrock record dated April 29, 2014, shall be considered for all purposes in the House to be allocations to the Committee on Appropriations under Section 302A of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974. Finally, Section 4 of the rule provides that during consideration of H.R. 4486 and H.R. 4487, pursuant to this resolution, the suballocations printed in the House Report at 113-425 shall be considered for all purposes in the House to be suballocations under Section 302B of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974. I have a motion from the gentleman, gentleman from Utah. I would uh, defer to myself for an explanation of the rule. The rule provides for an open amendment process for the Milcon VA bill and the traditional structured process for the legislative branch funding bill. The rule makes an order eight amendments to the legislative branch bill addressing many issues. The rule also contains provisions to ensure that we have budget enforcement in place for these bills and the rest of our appropriations work. We believe this on a bipartisan agreement and understanding. It's done in concert with the Congressional Budget Office as a result of circumstances that related to the uh, Murray Ryan and uh, uh, other uh, opportunities that we faced along with and including the President's budget that uh, came a little bit late. And so the Congressional Budget Office uses that as a marker uh, to to move against, and so that's why we are uh, doing that at this time. And then, as the committee appropriations committee has more time to make sure that it fully vets the rest of the uh, appropriation process, that will be done. With that said, questions or comments, amendments. I, I just have one. The is recognized. Comment. I noticed that there are no amendments were made in order that dealt with members of Congress flying first class on the federal dime. I hope that doesn't mean people are doing it. I don't know anybody who uses their MRA to fly first class, and I, I think that might have been an amendment you'd want to make in order. I'm, Would the gentlewoman like I've, to make an uh, no. amendment? No. I just well, wanted let, to make that comment. Yeah. Let, if, if the gentlewoman would engage me just for just a second, mm -hmm. I, I think that the gentlewoman knows that from time, to find, from time to time, and perhaps even most notably as we deal with our own processes of legislation in, in this branch, mm -hmm. there are lots of things which we simply haven't fully understood and vetted. And I'm not talking about that we couldn't have been aware of it. I'm talking about that there are some things where people are going back and looking at some things up to and including perhaps even the discussion that we had in here about our Portraits. I'm sure and that that's always had to be paid I, for by the members. You know what? I'm not sure because I don't know. Yeah. 
Well, what I would tell you is just gone through it. I that we we you. would certainly understand uh -huh. that that you it's mm -hmm. not a secret, but it may not be well understood. So what we're trying to do is to appropriately look at those items, and I do not disagree with you at all. I I, I think that there may be some reasons why there are people. Perhaps we would find out that blind first class. We have a number of war veterans. That have suffered some mm -hmm. bit of. Uh, yeah, Tammy Duckworth had one of them. There, we may have several, and I just think it's uh, probably appropriate that we understand what we're trying to do before we do it. I think I understand. And so I think what I'm trying to do as chairman of the committee is to be polite, respectful, mm -hmm. but to tell you I think that. We welcome members to come up here. We appreciate and respect them. There are some great ideas. I haven't had time to vet all and these ideas. Thinkers. And I think what I'm trying to do, that you're trying to give me credit for, if I'll be quiet, is to say thank you very much. And I will be very pleased, as a matter of fact, to sit down with the gentlewoman or work these issues with her, and I will get back to her. All right. Is that fair? Sure. And I appreciate the gentlewoman not pressing me on that issue because I'd like to be polite. Believe it or not. Yeah. No, I know you believe that. Good. Further discussion or amendment? Next. Seeing none, the uh, vote would now be on the motion from the gentleman from Utah. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, we have uh, now. Uh, not we are now not expecting another meeting this week, which means that we are uh, going to have Mr. Cole, who is present, the birthday boy, uh, will be leading this effort on the floor. Mr. Cole, we say that with great respect. I will be around the corner with another birthday, so don't want to be taunted too much myself. But. And Mr. Hastings. And Mr. Minority. Hastings, Judge Hastings will be representing the minority. This can Mr. This uh, Chairman, I just have one question. I gentleman's recognized. I don't really care about the first class issue. I just want to know how Elsie gets to drive around on bumpy roads in a car, and I still have to walk from my apartment back. I, how are you ahead of me with that? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> sort of like a rented mule, right? I, I appreciate the gentleman's questions and the answer. This uh, finishes the uh, Rules Committee meeting for the week.